Of all the tasks we've asked Harry to do for us, few will be more challenging and enjoyable than the one he now undertakes. We plan to reconstruct a Victorian wedding at the local church, and it will be Harry's duty, like that of his predecessors, to provide the bouquets, the garlands and the buttonholes for the bridal couple. Few flowers the head gardener grew were as significant as true orange blossom. No upper-class Victorian bride would go to the altar without some about her person. In the coded language of flowers, it conveyed the message that she was, hopefully, chaste and pure. Sprays of orange blossom had long been a traditional wedding flower. Roman brides wore it in their hair. Perhaps it's because citrus trees flower and fruit at the same time that their blossoms became a potent symbol of fertility. The advent of the glass house and the fashion for simpler hairstyles aided its 19th century revival. When the young Victoria married her dearest Albert in 1840, she wore a substantial wreath of the orange flower. In the previous century, bridal flowers had been mixed in colour, but soon it became fashionable for only white to be worn. Fortunately, the gardener had many flowers to choose from, like this delicate Eucharist, or the powerfully fragrant gardenia. Or Stephanotis with its sweetly scented waxen trumpets. But by the middle of the century, some commentators were pleading for relief from this snowy array. These, then, are some of the flowers Harry's grown for the marriage of our Victorian couple, which we're to stage in the parish church of Chilton Foliot. But first, there's another flower that requires Harry's urgent attention. If orange blossom promised fertility, it was the rose that signified enduring love. For centuries, the rose had held a special place in people's affections. New arrivals from China, crossed with European favourites, gave hybrids that could be brought on early under glass. Specially designed rose houses were built to give them the light and airy conditions they needed. We try not to water them more than once a week on the borders in case uh, the bottom gets wet or to the point of waterlogging, which you haven't got much control over. The pot ones will be fed at least once a week and these on the back walls will be fed about every other week with liquid farmyard manure. That keeps the growth going and uh, it'll keep the bloom a good quality. They're very beautiful. Uh, there's delicate shades in them, which there's not in a lot of the modern roses. A lot of the modern roses have got uh, set colours and, and they can be harder colours, but these uh, was pinky, whitey, uh, creamy was the predominant colours and uh, somehow or other it appeals. Mostly the bloom is what we used to term cabbage roses or cabbage formation like in the bloom and the cup shape uh, remains with them right throughout the life of the bloom. It's totally different to the HT roses of the modern ones, which almost all of them uh, go up to a point and open out to a totally different flower. New varieties filled the nurseryman's catalogues. Specialists grew huge quantities of young rose bushes, Thomas Rivers claimed to have a hundred thousand on his six acres in Hertfordshire. 
In 1858, the popularity of the rose was celebrated in spectacular style. The Dean of Rochester, the Reverend Reynolds Hall, together with a group of nurserymen, launched the first National Rose Show in London. 2,000 people attended, giving substance to Hall's belief that they who would have beautiful roses in their gardens must have beautiful roses in their hearts. The Victorians liked to group their plants, conifers in a pinetum and roses in a rosarium. I visited Warwick Castle, where a fine example is tucked away out of sight of the house. They recognised that when out of flower, massed rose bushes are extremely dull. Shirley Hibbard put it forcibly, a rose garden should be, in its season, a wonder to be sought, as, when its season is past, it is a wilderness to be avoided. Today, Warwick's Rosarium is evidently in season. It was created by the landscape designer Robert Marnock in 1869. Using Marnock's original layout, it's been restored by Paul Edwards. The Victorians' love of geometric design provides ample scope for the gardener to display his collection. There's four and a half tons of ironwork supporting the roses in this garden. But in the last century, not everyone trusted iron. One visitor wrote to the Gardener's Chronicle in 1892, saying, virtually all the best kinds would not grow when tied close to iron supports. Well, I don't think it was the iron. These old roses were very susceptible to disease. And I think the iron was an excuse when you didn't know how to control it. By the end of the century, the rosarium fell from favour. Longer flowering seasons, the popularity of rambler roses and changes in garden fashion took the rose away from its isolated setting. Under the influence of gardeners like Gertrude Jekyll and William Robinson, Formal rose gardens were grubbed up. Roses were now planted throughout the pleasure grounds, among the shrubs, and even scrambling up the trees. In contrast, despite being likened to monkeys mounted on giraffes, standard roses were always popular. Harry sets out on the involved task of creating a standard. He'll achieve this by budding the rose of his choice at the top of a wild briar stock. I can remember at my home when I was a boy, there was a man uh, on the uh, fruit farm uh, and he of course naturally lived in one of the cottages belonging to the estate and uh, he had a small plot in the front of his cottage uh, his speciality were standard roses and they of course were all on the old briar and uh, as a boy I used to admire those roses from over the fence Home-produced standard roses were first sold by Thomas Rivers. He sought to compete with the lucrative trade in French imports. His success created an industry. Armies of briar men, armed with mattocks, scoured the woods and hedgerows each winter in search of suitable specimens. It was said that on some railway lines in November and December, truckloads of briars were as common as coal wagons. But it was an unpopular trade with gamekeepers who resented briar men trampling through their woods during the shooting season. In 1879, a man came before the magistrates for allegedly stealing 150 pounds worth of briars. He was fined one pound 10 shillings and ordered to pay costs. 
Having uh, got them, selected them, and satisfied that these will make something useful, uh, you've got to plant them without delay. And uh, look after them through the growing season, which uh, will be April, May, June and July. And if you get a dry spell, see that they're not wanting for water or even mulch them down with uh, compost of some sort or other. And uh, late July, August, uh, they should be ready for budding. I'm going to select uh, this lovely old Glory Did I, John. I love this old rose. I remember it from several old places. It was even up here on the stable block. And I think this will do us proud. First part of the operation is to make the T cut. Roll the knife around on the top first and then make the slit down the stem and now peel the bark back. Having done that, one then has to cut the bud from the piece of bud wood leaving just a small shield which is slipped down into that T cut It doesn't always slip in as easy as one would like and having got it in there it is then bound around quite tightly to give an airtight joint of this wet raffia. The bud will then stop there until uh, the autumn and by that time you will be able to tell where the bud has taken or not. Nothing more will be done then until next February, March, when the head of the stock will be taken off, which will allow the buds to make the new bush. June and our wedding day approaches. This was the most popular month for marriages in the Victorian calendar. Whoever is married during June's long sunshiny days will not only be happy all her life, but will always retain the love of her husband. How the bride will look on her wedding day, if not how she feels, will owe much to the head gardener's skill. With the flowers gathered, Harry sets about the exacting task of making the bride's bouquet. The basics and the foundation of it was a little ball of moss 
done up like a mushroom. Uh, the mushroom head of it was just a little bit larger than a golf ball, not much. And it was bain rained with a bit of cotton wire or a bit of uh, ordinary cotton, just something to hold it together. And it was moist, but not wet. The flowers were wired up in what today is the orthodox way. The, the wire was put uh, from the base of the stem up towards the flower and twisted around and then brought back down to the base of the stem, forming quite a firm union. Naturally, the centre flower went in first and that went straight down through the mushroom cone. And from then on, you built around that, keeping it as even as you could and all nice and flat so that by the time you finished, it was going to be uh, more or less a, a solid matter flower without damaging the formation of each flower. Each wire was pulled straight down through. And the uh, Victorian descriptions of it was that the wires should not be twisted around one another. I thought again, because in days gone by, I'd done Victorian posies, and I'd always twisted the wire around. And I thought without performing that uh, part of the business, I was going to have a job to keep the... Uh, bouquet together but I found quite quickly that it, it was quite simple Finally myrtle sprigs are placed around the outer edge a symbol of the evergreen nature that ought to distinguish wedded love The trails of floral garlands that trim the dresses of Victorian brides were not to everyone's taste. Too much sunk in greenery, wrote one observer, and covered with too much orange flower and green leaves. Freshness was of the essence but the intricacy of the designs made this difficult to achieve. Making up that sort of thing, of course, was, was always a problem, and that problem still arises today. How much time have I got in the morning? And when I thought it and, and worked it out, I thought, well, I'm going to be pretty pushed in the morning. If I fall over, I'm not going to be ready. This will never do. And uh, an old method handed down to me from many, many years ago was to make them overnight and uh, put them somewhere as cool as you could. And, of course, we had the ideal place, the fruit room. Safe in their containers for the night, Harry will refresh the flowers with a fine spray of water. Mr. Milner, would you sign here, please, and your bride there? The next morning, the flowers were absolutely perfect. Because the spray was so light, uh, the flowers had absorbed that, and the flowers were completely dry. And uh, 
Much to my joy, they lasted the day for the bride. It's always nice to think that uh, when you're going to part with a bouquet, it's been done with flowers of the quality which will last somewhere between four to six hours. And uh, hours did stand the stay. Congratulations, Mrs. Miller. Mr. Miller. Congratulations, Julia. With the bride away on honeymoon, Harry has one last task to attend to. I've received this sprig of myrtle this morning down from the mansion. Cuttings, however, have an habit of not always striking root, and uh, I'm pretty sure there was a good many gardeners who had this failure and then had to do something about it and struck another one which did not come from the wedding bouquet. And I'm sure there was quite a, a number of young ladies who'd got a sprig of myrtle in the garden and they thought it'd come from their bouquet and it had not done so. I just hope this one will root so that it can be genuine. Of course, before the cutting uh, can go into the pot, it has to be trimmed. This is not a bad cutting. It's got a little side shoot, which uh, today I will ignore. I don't think the side shoot's quite big enough to root, although it has got a little eel on it. So I'm going up to the next set of leaves, which immediately under the leaf, of course, is the joint. And it is immediately under that joint that uh, you cut the cutting. I've placed the cutting round the edge of the pot. This was a thing gardeners have done for generation after generation, and it is thought that the aeration uh, was better around the edge of the pot than in the middle, which sometimes can become quite wet and soggy. When and how the tradition began is uncertain. But we do know that at the marriage of Victoria and Albert, there were sprigs of myrtle in the bride's bouquet. And there's a strong likelihood that some of these were later propagated. Legend has it that the myrtle bushes growing against the east front of Fulham Palace are from Queen Victoria's bouquet. But can they really be 150 years old? The only sure way to age them is to cut through the trunk at ground level and count the rings. And that, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to do. But whatever the authenticity of the Fulham Myrtles, a royal tradition grew up. Queen Victoria expressed a wish that the myrtle sprays of the marriage bouquets of each member of the royal family be propagated. Thus it was that the myrtle in the Princess Royal's bouquet provided sprigs for the Princess of Wales five years later. The Illustrated London News described the dress of the bride as a petticoat of white satin trimmed with chatelaines of orange blossom and myrtle. This is the day we've been looking for. This is the cutting which we took from the bride's bouquet on the day of her wedding. This one, as you can see, has rooted, and there's the little fine uh, root formation. 
around the edge of this ball of soil and that is at an ideal state now for potting on. We are now going to pot it on into the time-honoured five-inch pot. It will receive a crock in the bottom to give it sharp drainage and then a bit of coarse fibre material from the loam on top of that. Just a little bit of soil and that is firmed so that there's a nice firm base for the root ball which is coming out of the propagating pot to, to sit on. And this must be kept intact and the soil filled around it. I hate to find anybody potting anything on and they've knocked the previous root ball to pieces. It checks the plant considerably and it uh, takes much longer for it to get away. Gradually fill the soil in around it, firming it with your three fingers as you go, not the thumb. I ate again to see gardeners using the thumb to, to uh, firm a pot. Finish off with a little crummy soil on the top and give it the, uh, the shake on the side, both hands, and uh, it is now potted up and it's ready to go away into the cold house. Uh, it will not, however, be allowed to get subject uh, to frost this coming winter. Sometime by the end of next year, it should be a nice little plantlet which can be presented uh, to the bride. In due course, by the time we hope that the bride has got a daughter of her own, it will be large enough to have sprigs pulled from it and put into the bouquet and thus uh, completing the cycle.